uh, Rosalie, it's been so exciting and meaningful to be at, at a, a bunch of different festivals this year, um, celebrating your mother and her work and your work together. Um, I can only imagine the kinds of encounters and experiences you're having, whether it was in Cannes this year, which was a terrific celebration of, of your mother, um, and, but I'm also thinking of Telluride uh, this, this past year as well, which was really special. Yeah. So um, maybe, uh, how, how has it been? To, it, must, it must be really, um, if nothing else, uh, an, an opportunity to, uh, to share in the, the feelings that we all uh, have for, for Agnes Varda this um. past few months. First, uh, I, um, first, I want to tell you, Eugene, that uh, I've been here at this festival with Agnes several times. Um, this festival was very special for her because I think it was the first time she came in New York, uh, she came to this festival. So this festival was kind of, you know, she had a lot of love for the staff, for everybody, for the place, for the Lincoln Center. So I'm very happy to be here tonight because you know I accept only to talk about her in places, in festivals where she used to love to go. Oh, it meant something for her first. Second, you know, it has been kind of a, a road full of uh, love and empathy since Agnes uh, died in, in end of March. And I have to say that while working with her, I did not realize really um, how she had an influence on a lot of different uh, type of person. I mean, journalists, but students, cinephile, normal people, art people. And so I've been strong to do all I'm doing about transmission and preservation because of all the meetings and all the encounters I've been through. And I have people like Raj and some others that are, I feel that they are with me. So, you know, it's very special. I have, on one side is my mother, and on the other side is the public filmmaker with a long life of work, a body of work, and that we are just beginning to realize that she has been very important in narration, in um, being a searcher of narration, of being between short film documentaries and fiction, how the digital came in her life, and this is film we have done is about that. I've been a little bit long, maybe. Not at all, not at all. Um, let me ask you one more question, a uh, more personal one, but uh, when you were growing up, I wonder at what point you realized, was there a moment or a time in your life when you realized that um, she wasn't just your mother, but she was Agnes Varda, and that difference between <laughs> Maybe that I'm going to make you same. laugh a little bit, but um, when I was little, uh, I, you know, in school you have to put the name of your parents, and usually they ask you, what do they do as a job? So I remember very clearly coming back home and asking Agnes and Jacques saying, what should I put? So Jacques said, well, you can put I'm a poet, okay? <laughs> um, this and is for, Jacques Demy. Yeah, Jacques Demy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Agnes said, you put cineast. And I said, what is cineast? <laughs> you know, well, I do films, okay. And then I asked them, but what age you are? And they say, we're 35, and we, it's going to be long staying 35. <laughs> OK? I know that now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back to school. I put poet. The teacher looked at me and said, but your father is a poet? OK. Weird thing. OK. So, you know, it was a bit like that. And I said to them, you know, you're not, um, you're not very well known, in fact. <laughs> so maybe I could change my name. And I could call myself Rosalie Bardot. It would mean more. <laughs> 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 so when you know what happened with Brigitte Bardot, thanks God I did not change my name. <laughs> Glad you kept it. <laughs> no, um, to be serious. Yeah. 
um, I didn't I didn't realize that I, I I went on shootings but I didn't really realize what it meant yeah. um, I, I think I realized more uh, what it really it meant um, maybe at 11 12 years old but then you know I grew with the film that means I saw them at each age of my life and in mm -hmm. fact in a way each time I saw them differently when, you know, the Ambrelage of Cherbourg, I had my first love affair that did not work, yeah. then I understood, you know, that you could cry for that. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, you know, with Matthew, my brother, we always say the films are a little bit our children in a way, and, and we cannot say one, we prefer one, but what we can say, we've been raised in this as it's normal yeah. to see new films that your parents have done. And sometimes the subject we could not understand at a, you know, a certain age. But each time you see a film, each decade when you re-see the film, you see it differently. And I think what is very interesting in education is how you can, with a teenager or children, it depends on the film, and adults, if you see a film several times and you kind of study a film a little bit, you discover much more each time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that when I go and do, you know, kind of master class, and I, I try to tell them a film that you really like, don't be ashamed to see it several times in your life. You will always discover something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Raj, we, one of the things I've been thinking about with uh, Anya Svarda is that um, unlike some filmmakers who, who have an illustrious career um, and, and we celebrate them after their passing, sometimes there's a, there's a gap between their most recent work and, and the moment when, when they pass and we're able to kind of take stock. In this case, um, Agnes was working right up until the last moment. Her film, in fact, her most recent film, which we'll see this week, had just premiered at the Berlin Festival in February. She passed in March. Um, you at, at MoMA and your role at MoMA have been able to support, um, collect her work, but also support her more recent work. Um, I wonder if you could talk about some of the, the more specifically, some of the, the um, work that you've done in supporting Agnes in her more recent uh, films. Uh, and why? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's been the profound pleasure of my life, both professionally and, and very thankfully personally, um, thanks to the people that Rosalie and, and Agnes are. But I've been sitting here just realizing that she was with us in February. Yeah. And, and it's, it's crazy. Uh, and uh, all of this, she knew. She knew that this film, the latest that you'll experience, I think, starting tomorrow uh, here at, at the film, or at film at Lincoln Center at the New York Film Festival, uh, and then across the country, and it's already been around the world, is what she wanted you to have. It's her goodbye kiss, in a way. It's her invitation to be an artist and be involved with an artist's life. And for me to be... Um, you know, responsible for the collective memory of cinema culture that, that MoMA has been responsible for, and, and, and yes, has been a part of the MoMA family for years. Um, Larry Kardish introduced me to, to Rosalie and, and Agnes nearly 13 years ago when I got this crazy job, and, um, and it's because of that friendship and that closeness that I was at a lunch, I don't know, six or seven years ago, um, which, you know, whenever Rosalie and Agnes would come to New York, we would find a time to meet and we found a time to have lunch. And they told me about this documentary of working with a young, crazy French street photographer named JR. Had I ever heard of him? Yeah, sure, I've heard of JR. Well, he, you know, we're making a, a film and um, we just need a little bit more to get it across the finish line. And my God, am I so grateful that I happened to be in that position at that time to do something for, as you mentioned, one of the world's great artists, period. 
cinema, photography, installation, sculpture, as you'll see in the film, Agnes touched all of it um, and touched it all profoundly. Um, but the fact that, I mean, yes, it's both strange and frustrating that they needed our support, but such a blessing to me and, and hopefully to the world ultimately that um, we, we were able to do this. And I have to say, I mean, she would never say it and hopefully the record will write it and I'll hopefully be a part of that. Rosalie Varda has done so much for cinema culture. Yes, this woman was her mother, but you took an artist who frankly could have been in that situation where her best work was behind her and gave her the opportunity with Faces Places and with Varda by Agnes to be brand new and to be brand new on, as she said, goodbye. Yeah. We, we were good partners in crime. No crime in... Crime of cinema. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your, your question, Eugene, but, um, you know, it, it was both confusing that someone like me, you know, our, our generation could be of use to someone, a, a titan, like, like Agnes, but also it, may, it brought it bound, back down to the essential, which cinema in many ways is about the relationships, and I think Agnes has always asked us to find that, right? Find the human connection. And I had forgotten that in a way. And working with them both brought me back to that. And I will never go back to forgetting. It, it, it will be impossible. The last years that I've spent with Rosalie and Agnes, um, including this moment and continuing, um, will not allow me to forget what she has taught us always through her work, which is that humanity is what propels us and should drive us to be creative and to be productive citizens. Thank you. Uh, Karen, um, you're a film critic and, and writer and thinker about film. Um, maybe from a personal perspective, help us understand maybe how you were introduced or how Agnes's work introduced itself to you and, and what it not just what it means to you personally, because I, I, as I mentioned to you backstage, I'd love for you to speak personally, but also if you might opine about her impact on, on cinema, on culture of cinema. Well, unfortunately, I never met her, but one thing that struck me, and, and she alludes to it a little bit in the new film, is that even people who only know her through her films have this great affection for her. It's a very personal response, and partly because we know her on screen as a presence. It's a very vivid, warm, open presence. And so even other filmmakers that we may respect enormously, you don't have that same connection that I think we have for her. And it's a very unusual thing, I think, and it speaks to who she is and what she put into her film. And I'll give you another little preview or something. The BBC, which I write for, does an annual poll of international critics, which they're in the process of doing now. And this year's question is, what are the 10 best films by women directors ranked? And my number one, without doubt, is Cleo from five to seven. There was no question, one of her early films, because it's groundbreaking in so many ways. The use of real time, the way that she moves the camera, but also it is so emotionally resonant, the woman waiting to hear whether she has cancer, and it holds up tremendously well, which is astonishing for a film of its period. It looks like the 60s, but it feels like today because she gets the emotion of all of her characters, especially women. And I think that's a through line in all of her films from start to end. She has this emotional reality that means they age the way classic films age. They don't feel dated, they don't feel like time capsules. And I also think that she really didn't get the kind of credit, I know it's not a contest, but the guys in the new wave got such a lot of credit mm. and she did not for, and her work is so innovative and her camera work is so incredibly graceful and the way that she combined um, documentary and fiction in all of her films it's really important and groundbreaking. And I think she's just now, thanks to people like Raj and you, starting to get the credit for that that she should have gotten at the start of her career, I think. Can I just say something yes. about the Nouvelle Vague? Because it's funny. Um, so she, 
directed her first film in 1954. She never did a short film before, and um, she did not know the people of the Nouvelle Vague or the Cahier du Cinéma, the, you know, the famous critic uh, journal. I don't know how you say it. Magazine. Magazine, yeah. Um, and when the film was released in one cinema, like a double program, uh, of course, Les Cahiers did very bad reviews. And François Truffaut did a bad review. And years later, he wrote a letter to, to say, I'm so sorry. Um, your film, in fact, is very important. And um, we didn't s understand your film when we saw it. But I'm saying that because I think, you know, the Nouvelle Vague um, is very important. And all those men of the Cahiers du Cinéma were thinking about a new way to direct films. It, it, it is important too, but it was kind of a two worlds. Mm -hmm. They could not imagine that if you did not go to a cinematheque, if you hadn't seen three films every afternoon and after going to the coffee and redoing the film and drinking a beer and, and next day writing and everything, you could not direct a film. And I think they were a little bit annoyed you know, like a <laughs> little bit annoyed, you know. So they put, prefer to put it on the side and just say, we don't know about that film, you know. And weirdly enough, she met Jacques Demy in 58 at the tour festival for short films, which, where she has presented Du Côté de la Côte, which was um, a little film about the French Riviera. They, they, they met, they fell in love, and, and after fi finally it's Jacques, who really helped her to do Godard and Jacques Demy, who helped her to do Cléo. And then after, sh she was not in the Cahier du Cinéma with the group of the guys because they, they were very misogyn globally. But she was accepted as a film director, which is so incredible now if we think about that, because this was the reality. But she didn't care. She was on the top of that, she said to me, I'm not a position to put myself as a film director. I'm a, f a woman film director. No, this is not my thing. I'm a film director point. And it's only the work that is important. And that we need this to work and not to put seduction first, f work first. Um, Maddie, I'm going to ask you um, two questions. The first question is really kind of the same one that I that I posed to Karen, and that is maybe to speak personally about Agnès and and her work, what it means to you, picking any or as many films as you want, but also um, as a member of the programming team here at Film and Lincoln Center to also uh, talk about um, collecting that work and presenting it later this year in the retrospective, and so to talk a little bit about the approach that that you've taken uh, with our, uh, that our team has taken to put this together for later in the year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, uh, not to repeat a title that's come up multiple times, but uh, absolutely, uh, Cleo from Femme to Seven was my introduction to Agnes um, and meant a great deal to me uh, when I first encountered it. I was studying film, studying French film in particular, spent some time uh, in France studying film in Paris. And uh, I, I was mostly uh, engaging with uh, the uh, new wave directors who were men, the, the, the men among the new wave film roster. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was a little bit later that I saw my first film uh, by Varda and I was blown away. It was something completely different. And, um, I, I, I hesitate to say that I related to it differently because I'm a woman and because it was the first French New Wave film that I encountered from, truly from a woman's subjectivity. But I think that that was, that was a part of it. And I think that she was doing something that was um, both of a piece with this cinematic conversation that was happening at the time, but that was also something radically different. And certainly 
uh, one of the most exciting things to me about bringing together a retrospective, uh, which I'm excited to say is uh, the most comprehensive retrospective of her films to date, uh, and that will be touring the country after uh, it screens, uh, or after we present it here, uh, starting in December. Um, but it's looking at the entire scope of her career is just to map out incredible mind of, of uh, an inquisitive artist who, um, you know, unlike the, the sort of stereotype of the new wave film director as the, the sort of uh, cinephile who's packing a film with references to this uh, very sort of um, self, self self-referential film culture that uh, was, um, that you see with when you think of Truffaut, for instance, she was an a very inquisitive and exploratory creative force who just followed her inspiration in directions that may, I imagine, uh, were unpredictable and, and difficult to see coming. Um, and that's the, I think that's the, the beauty of a, of a retrospective, is that you can put these films in dialogue with each other, look at a film that she made in 1962, next to a film that she made in 1985, next to a film that she made in 19, or, 2018, you know, and and, and uh, it's sort of a it's it's in some ways it's an old-fashioned model of looking at um, the work of an auteur as a as a unified body of work. But it's uh, when when somebody's body of work is so diverse and rich, it's exciting and new and um, revealing in different ways. Mm -hmm. I want to ask um, each of you. Uh, well, let me ask the audience first. Uh, is there are there any is there any people are there anyone here who has never seen a film by Anya Sparta? Everybody's a, okay. A couple people. Um, for folks that are still discovering her work, or maybe um, folks listening to this um, this podcast and hoping to learn more, for each of you, um, maybe either offer a place to start, a film to start with, or a film that maybe that was meaningful to you for some reason that maybe might be overlooked or, or maybe someone might not think to, uh, to, 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 to include in a survey. I'm gonna start before she does because she's gonna say the best one. So. <laughs> I'm gonna say The Gleaners and I because for me, it, it's almost like a Rosetta Stone for this, this humanity that I mentioned before, her ability to look at something that we would look at every day. And I mean, it, again, this isn't, there, there's many um, films that this would apply to that she's made, but with Gleaners, it, it's both humbling and, and almost embarrassing at first that she's able to see things that um, we should all be able to see and, and engage with people that we should all be able to engage with. But and she, she has this ability, I'm, and I'm gonna speak about her in the present tense, because she's with me <laughs> still. She has this ability um, to, to do something that I think if a dude was doing it, it would shame us, right? Like, you're looking over these people and shame on you, and yes, never shames us. She brings us with her, even though she knows we're so far away from where she's starting, right? And she, in, in Gleaners and I, she just, it's mesmerizing and it's infectious and you will never not look in the corners and look at your neighbors the same way after you've seen it. Well, I think Cleo is a great place to start and also Faces Places if you haven't seen that. And there's such a great through line because there's a scene in Cleo when she's walking down the street and she talks about seeing the people's faces. And, and that's what Agnes did all the way through her career. I call her Agnes even though I've never known her because it, it feels so personal. But the way that she looks at people's faces is something that you see through all her career. But a little film that I think is often overlooked is Daguerreotypes, which is a little documentary that she made in her neighborhood, just looking at the shopkeepers and people on her street. And it tells you a lot about the way she looked at people and the way she encountered them and the way she valued everybody for whatever individual um, thing they were doing or who they were. 
And I think that's one that sort of gets you know, overlooked a lot because there's so much that, that, um, that she's done. Um, well, one that I think sort of stands out and stands on its own um, is uh, the Bonaire, which in some ways uh, is one example of, of a uh, surprising entry in her filmography because it's um, the, the, the sense of humor that she injects into uh, this sort of parable about the patriarchy and about um, gendered ideas of what happiness can be and can look like and should be uh, is the humor is subtle, but it's powerful. It's 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 um, there's like an energy to the um, statement that she's making that is uh, really woven into the film on every level, stylistically and, and formally and um, texturally. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's remarkable, so. Uh, yeah. Rosalie, we're not uh, asking you to pick a favorite because it's impossible. No, it's, it's, it's not a favorite film. I think, you know, for the young generation today, I think to go, uh, to begin by all the gleaners, all faces, places is maybe the most easy two film to get in. And if they go through the film till the end, um, maybe they will, maybe they will want to see another one. You know, you you did studies of cinema, so you already studied film. But I'm talking about an, an audience that is not studying cinema. You know, an audience that look at the TV uh, is on Netflix, uh, on Amazon, and the clips, and on YouTube, and everything. I think for this generation, those two films are the good entrance. Because even if The Gleaner was done in 2000, you know, nearly 20 years ago, it is still so what we are in the society. People left over, garbage, what do we do? Can, how can we do something, each, other, each of us? I think if Agnes would have been here with us. Um, she would. She talked about those total social problems we're having on the planet, but she did it already 20 years ago. And she did it because the digital camera helped her to go near the people with a very light crew, you know, and shooting herself, speaking to the people, so there was no uh, aggressivity about a big camera and a sound person and everything. I would say that. Because, you know, Le Bonheur is very sophisticated already. It's sophisticated aesthetically, uh, by the aesthetic, uh, how she wanted to do a film. For me, it's, it's, you know, Jacques Demy did The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which is Matisse, which is something, and Agnès did Le Bonheur, which is Les Impressionnistes. It's the two films, weirdly, they have done those films with one year and a half of you know, difference, first the umbrella after the happiness. But for me, it's those two films, it's like if they're talking to each other. We can do the same kind of exercise of aesthetic. But Agnes took a finally a kind of a classic subject. What is happiness? Can we love two women? Uh, and she is a woman. So she was very criticized at that period when she did the film yeah. because they would say that this film uh, done by a woman, it's really, you know, like uh, not normal. And this film helped, I think, a lot of men about the situation of having another woman in their life. So it's a very interesting subject how she did it. So. I would say what you chose as Le Bonheur is a little bit difficult for my thought, but you can go and see it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Have more faith in the younger generation. <laughs> She's into it. It's good. <laughs> it's because I'm old, you know, no. so. <laughs> um, before we take some questions from the audience, Rosalie, I want to ask you, um, to share with us uh, an understanding of some of the work you're doing now to preserve and to uh, make uh, Agnes Varda's films available? 
Yes, well, Agnes began the work of preservation and uh, restoration and protecting uh, her film and Jacques Demy's film first. After his death in 1990, she really started to, p to gather the, all the film together on the family company. Uh, so we were able to kind of protect them. And then when the digital arrived, we were ready to do the restoration. So of course, I've been a little bit he helping, but I've been working wi really with her since uh, 15 years and really seriously, seriously, maybe 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, she was very concerned about preservation and she was very concerned before. Everybody was really concerned about. She always said we should you know, know the technique, we should protect the film, protect the negative and everything. And suddenly we were in, in confronted that Cleo Tsaka said negative burn. Lola negative burned in in the you know uh, the lab had a fire and there was maybe 200 negative of that period beginning of the 60s that burned and they didn't even say then anything to anybody really? yeah so what happened is then when she discovered that in the late 90s she was like wow we have to know exactly where our, our negative so in France, we have a preservation called the Archive, uh, you know, uh, Les Archives du Film, which is a place where you can put the negative and they are protected. So she began that work uh, of first, you know, preservation. Then we did restoration, digitalize the film to have DCP. We have done that with all the catalog, except two short films of Jacques Demy, because we cannot find the negative. So we are like still searching for those negative. But the other part of her work, she started in 19, well, when Jacques was still alive, with the film she directed, Jacques Ou de Nantes, which is a film about the childhood of Jacques Demy. And it's not only a, f a film about his childhood, it's a film about the Second World War. It's a film about the film of Jacques Demy. Is it's, it's a formal film where can you put in the same film a fiction except of film done on a 20 year uh, career um, and, and kind of a documentary on Jack that was sick and that was going to die. So it's really a kind of a talented, I think, uh, film. You know. mm -hmm. And after the film, this film, she said to me, we have to work with the young generation. We have to work with education. And you know, at the beginning, I didn't really understood all this. I thought, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit formal. And during the years working next to her, I understood that this was very important. We are working in educational program with the films. We're, we're trying to do books. We, we did an exhibition on Jack the Me films, I hope one day we'll do a really exhibition on Agnes' work, I mean, body of work, which is photography since 1949, uh, cinema since uh, the 50s, art, visual art installation since 2003. You know, it's a body of work. But she always was ready to speak to young people, to young audience, to go in, in university. She has done so many masterclass. I respect her so much of giving her time, her energy doing that. That's why I wanted to do Varda by Agnes with her. Because I thought, you know, all those masterclass, sometimes they have been filmed, you know, like in Harvard or in China or uh, in Getty Museum or I don't know, or here. But you know, it's just film for archive, but it's not cinema. Mm -hmm. And I propose her, why don't we do a film about you, but it's cinema. But you speak of cinema, and at the same time, you do a lesson of cinema. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, that's a good idea. We could do that, maybe. But, um, you know, people are going to be bored. I say, I don't think so, really. Because you said something very important. 
you said people know Agnes because she is in her film. People know Agnes' voice because she did so many voiceover. And it's true, she puts herself a little bit in the film. So finally, people know her as they would know, not, you know, not a very close friend, but as if they would know, a, a, you know, a relative or something we meet every two or three years, you know, we meet that person. And this finally gives, um, how you say in English, very close, how you say, uh, un rapprochement, you know, uh, yeah, uh, uh, being proximity. close, yeah, yeah. proximity, exactly, proximity with the audience. Mm. I think so, you know. Until the end, she was concerned about transmission, and she said, "I hope you know you will, with my brother Mathieu Demi, you will continue to 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 really spread." She said, "Spread the good words to go to cinema." And one of the things that struck me about the new film is that it made me very hungry to see her photographs and her installations, mm -hmm. which we don't know as much in this country, but uh, we know them in her films as she's presented them. But it would be really great to see those firsthand and have an exhibition of her photography or her installations. I hope so. That's, that's my job, no? There you go. Uh, I, can't, yes. I can't do your job for <laughs> once. <laughs> um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. And I do want to mention, I, and I'm looking to my colleagues in the back, I think there are a limited number of tickets that were just released or are currently available for tomorrow night's screening. Jordan says yes. So um, if you are hoping to see this film, Varda Bain, yes, I think tomorrow is your best chance. Uh, there are a couple screenings, but I think tomorrow has a few extra tickets available. So uh, after the screening, I would encourage you to uh, take, an, take advantage of that opportunity. And it's, um, it's also opening on November 22nd. Opening here as, uh, and other, th other cinemas, but we'll talk about here. Yes, November 22nd, <laughs> a month before the retrospective, but it'll Very be good. a fall and winter of Agnes. Very good. Okay, so let's, um, we have microphones on either side. We're gonna wait for the mic. We'll start right here in the second row and then we'll go down the other side of the second row. Uh, we have, we, we're recording this for the podcast so we'll wait for the mic for just one sec. Thank you. It's, it's not really a question, but when you were both talking about her humanity and her connection with the audience, there's an image in, I think it's the Gleaners, where she has that little camera and the lens cap kind of dangling and then she shoves her arm out the car window, if I got the right film. And she's playing with a flab on her arm and talking about her aging. And it, it's, it just never left me, that image. That I, I, for me, that's when something clicked very profoundly with her work. So I'll share a little story. When, um, so to get funding from the Museum of Modern Art, it, there is a process. I tried to make it less cumbersome and onerous. But Agnes and JR made a beautiful little video pitch to the trustees of the Museum of Modern Art. And um, someday I'll, I'll share it. For, my, for now it's mine. But um, <laughs> in the video, the pitch was, well, hi, I'm Agnes Varda, and I love young people. And JR was like, hi, I'm JR, I love old people. And we're going to make a film about that. <laughs> so. <laughs> go to this side, um, second row, hi. Hi, thank you very much. My question is like, how do you see more women coming into the film industry? Because she's a, it's not a very easy industry, still, still a lot of misogyn presence there. I like that you touched on that. And second is, do you think she would have had a different career if she was to be in the US versus France? So I think, you know, uh, at least in France, there is now globally 26, 27% of the film that are directed for cinema. Huh? I'm just talking about cinema by women. And there is a lot of uh, cinema producer women in France. Mostly producer, but not directors. 27% in France of the film that have been directed last year were directed by women. Uh, it's not 50, but it's much better than several years ago, you know. And for TV, there's a lot of uh, women um, directing. But Agnes Varda said a long time ago, don't, you're not obliged to choose only being a film director. 
there is a lot of job in cinema. And now you have a lot of director of photography who are women. You have sound engineer who, have, who are women. Um, I mean, you're, you know, it's not only being a film director, it's, I would say, being in all the process of doing films. Editor, uh, and it's, it's much better. Anything cannot change in, in one year or two years. If you imagine that there were several generations where there was very few women, to be, you know, going to 50%, it will take several years. But I think something has totally changed now. If you want to do a film and you're a woman or you're a man today, I think you nearly have the same problems. You, d you don't agree with me, but I produce. Okay, I produce Agnes, but I have a lot of friends who are producers in France at least. If you look, there's a lot of women who are doing their first film feature. It's maybe not big, big, huge budget, but they're doing their films. So it's progressing. And I think now people are aware, which they were not. 20 years ago, they were really not, really uh, like now. I mean, producers were more men, and they didn't even think it was something, a problem not to produce more women. This has totally changed now. I mean, w in, in every conversation I have with people from the business, really, it has changed. It is not perfect. Uh, it will not be perfect. Never perfect. And it will be a struggle all the time. But it's better. And I don't know what Raj thinks because for the States. Second question. Would her career have been different in the States? I have no clue. What I know is that when she lived in the States two times in the end of the 60s, she has done three films, two short films and one uh, feature fiction film. And when she was in the 80s, she did two films, a kind of one fiction and one documentary. She always have done those films with no money, little money, then she signed a contract with EMI to do a, um, a fiction film with a beautiful script. Never went through. She wanted Bruce uh, Springsteen to, to be in the film, and the studio said, why, why, what a weird idea. So in the States, I have, I don't know. Uh, she was not in the system. She didn't want to be in the system. So maybe for her, it was easier to be in Europe and be in France because she, you know, created her own company in 54. So that means globally, she nearly co-produced or nearly done as a production all her film. And she always said, I've done it because then I was free to decide what I've, I would do. I don't know if it helps you with my answers. You, you, do, you feel that it's not enough. What do you feel? It's not enough? I feel that I, can, I still cannot find a clear explanation why it's this glass ceiling saying that women should be in front of the camera and not directors. Yeah, it's true that m women are predominantly pushed to producing or to other un b below the line type of jobs in the film industry, but it, it's really hard to be a, like in the director's club as a woman, even now, in 2019. And I don't find a clear explanation why. And I don't feel it's changing. I feel like, personally, I feel like the Me Too movement created more resentment at this point. That's my personal opinion. Now, I think, I think it's difficult. Uh, you know, if you're in a, in a business where I would say 95% percent were men and suddenly you have to put this and go to 50. You need script, good script. You need energy. You need to find a producer. You need all this and this process as you know to do a, a long feature is maybe several years. So it's normal that it 
cannot be 50% now. You know what? I mean, if you want to direct a film, you first you need to write a script. Then your script should be good enough that even better than a male script, you know. But then you find a producer, and then the producer has to find the money. So the process of production is long. And since it's long, uh, we would like now that this process is shorter, so we would have more women directing films and being, you know, finished. But the process is three years, four years. So I think this, you know, what you're telling of ceiling, glass ceiling, I don't feel in Europe so much. There's a lot of first film in France that have been directed by women in the last five years. Every year, more and more. So we, we have to continue. And I think, you know, it's not against men. That's very important. Feminist is not against men. Feminist has to be with men. And when we will convince producers, uh, actors of finance, to finance woman film, but not woman film, to finance a film, we will each time gain one step, one step. In the third row, yes, hi. Um, I was wondering if perhaps the reason the, the critics were so unkind to her is because they're very subject to the fad of the moment, and the Nouvelle Vague was the fad, and Agnès was not, because she speaks to the heart. And their films, although they're technically interesting, I suppose. Mm, Toni Morrison said that one of the reasons people don't read modern American novels is because the novelists aren't interested in character. So if the central character has a tree fall on him or her in the third chapter, you don't miss him for the rest of the book. And Agnes was so interested in the human being and in the human heart and in all of the things that are so evident in the places and spaces and that's I think how we get to know her. It, it's just, it's not a cerebral film, although it's uh, very enlightened, but it's, it's more than just cerebral. It's head and heart. And I, in the Nouvelle Vague, I, that just wasn't fashionable. And I wonder if she had that not so much whether she was in, in France or elsewhere, but if she had come into her own, perhaps in the 90s, whether um, things might have been different. Because certainly what the <coughs> critics said about her, I mean, you wondered if they even watched her films. Well, I think that's a good point, actually, because technically she was really advanced in those days. So I think people who were harsh on her were overlooking a lot of the things that were really radical that you would not even notice, or something like Vagabond, where she has all those long traveling shots. And, and it's easy to overlook that if you're just focused on the character. So I think she was shortchanged a lot in terms of the technical things that she did incredibly well that she didn't get enough credit for then. I mean, the other thing I would say, at least, Historically, I mean, keep in mind she was coming up at a time not only during the Nouvelle Vague, but the rise of this auteurist theory, right? So, um, which was very male centric, and and yes, was at least as interested in other people as she was herself, right? As opposed to this idea that you should be this self-contained genius and totally obsessed with yourself and your own genius. So I'm not saying that she wasn't interested in her own in intellect. She certainly was, and she was incredibly articulate about her ideas, and, but she was equally interested in individuals on their own terms, not only how she saw them, right? On, and that is kind of a profound difference from not only what these filmmakers were doing, but what critics were writing about them and this whole kind of new idea about how you talk about good cinema in, in this auteurist vein, you can tell I'm a little bit prejudiced against it. And I still believe, or I believe that fundamentally cinema is, an, is a collaborative art form. 
as Rosalie was pointing out. So the closer we can get to that acknowledgement, the closer we get to a more egalitarian uh, art form, which in essence it always has been and Agnes always knew. We have time for a couple more questions. We're gonna go back there and then up here. Uh, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, um, comparing the two films, The Cleaners and the Eye, which was made in 2000, year 2000, and uh, Faces and the Place, Faces and Places, which was uh, made in 2017. Um, as uh, m most of you have said, in those films, when we're watching Anne's films, we feel actually more about her, although her cameras were focused on her subject, but we feel her uh, humanities. Uh, so my question is, uh, close in 17 years, comparing to these two films, how can we see uh, social changes have changed her? I don't know if I can really answer this question because I'm not her, you know. Um, what changed, uh, I mean, in her work, I think the digital changed the way she worked. It did not change the way she looked at people, but it changed the way she did it. The rest of the question is difficult uh, for me to answer. Maybe you can answer that, but you know, I mean, society has, uh, of course, it's not the same between those two periods. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is hard because each film is very much yeah. uh, speaking to a moment. I mean, they, it will be, obviously, I'm still enamored of cleaners, and I, you know, suggest it as a kind of entry point, and I think Faces Places will remain an entry point to her work. But there is something personal that changed for her that I think you can see strategically, which I think is brilliant in a way that's hard to talk about because it is so personal, was the beginning of her loss of eyesight. And the very strategic idea to partner with a younger filmmaker who has demonstrated his ability to see quite well the things that are out in public and to make those things out in public. I mean, he happens to be a guy who takes images of people and makes them giant so she can see them, right? I mean, so she's taking this thing that's happening to her body, she's finding uh, a solution to it, which also happens to be a brilliant strategy for creating a new fo work of, of cinema. So I, I, you know, she's doing these things which aren't saying strategic sounds too, too strategic. You know, she did it naturally because she likes JR and he was an interesting artist and like, yeah, what the hell, let's get in your camera van and drive around France. Um, <laughs> but if you've seen it, you've seen the profoundly touching and human result. And, and don't forget that GR is taking pictures of anonymous poop. I mean, not, not, not celebrities. So it's really touching Agnes, you know, about her own work. And I remember when she was looking at some books of GR, like, uh, the, f the book on Cuba, you know, on all the walls, wrinkled walls, old people. Uh, she felt that he did not put a, bar a barrier, uh, kind of a fence between old and young people. She felt in, in GR, you know, a kind of humanity to approach one person, whatever is this person. And you're right to say that knowing that she would be blind, losing her eyes, she thought it was kind of a very light way of not speaking only of her, but having a young guy with black glasses that would seem much more than her. <laughs> and there's always something, you know, we can speak about serious things, but can we be light? Can we be, can we be just, you know, a little bit of humor? Can we be curious? And I would say, really, this this really um, amazed all the people working with her is that she would keep that curiosity all the time. Even at the end, you know, she would 
not see always so well, but sometimes she would see better, and so she would say, my eyes are like waves, you know, like coming, going, <laughs> and I see well, and then sometimes we would say, we yeah, sometimes she's just not seeing because she doesn't want to see, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, but you're right. I think it's a way of um, speaking about, you know, losing what is the most precious thing for her, her eyes, her camera, a way of being able to do a frame. But in the same time, she thought traveling with somebody, with an artist next to her, it would be softer to lose her eyes. That's, that's the idea, is can we do that, but it's not too tough. The film is a little bit about that. And it's about, yes, we can chat with a young guy without being a cougar. <laughs> We have time for one more question. <laughs> one more question. Um, I have a question, but before I ask, I want to make a comment. I met uh, Agnes two years ago um, after seeing Faces Places, and it was social gathering. And I'm meeting her 10 minutes after I saw the film, and I come, and she's sitting on the chair. And I basically put, uh, go on my knees like to propose to her, and I'm saying, Agnes, I just saw Faces Places. There's so much beauty. There's so much humanity. And I didn't even know if she speaks English or not, so I, I, I don't speak French. And I was like, so much heart, so much heart. And she's like, yes, sounds right to me. You know, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Like, seems like movie well promoted. And like, yes, well, 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 well promoted. And I couldn't say anything else, but um, it was a very interesting touch. But at that moment, I was thinking so much confidence the person has. And the question I wish I could ask, have asked her, but I'm... Mm, forwarding this question to you, how did, she t uh, how did she take criticism of her own work and did she doubt her own art? What? Has she ever doubt her own art? She doubted every day. That's, uh, that's the only way to go forward. And for the critic, I think, you know, in a way, she would say, I don't really care. But like any artist, they do care. <laughs> and when it's a really bad critic, which happens sometimes, she would say, oh, you didn't see that, yeah, okay. And she would say, okay, uh, let's drink a tea <laughs> and do something else. But I think, you know, like every filmmaker, um, they want to do a film to be shared to be seen, to have not an empty you know, theater, to be full of people. And she always thought her film should make you think, should make you emotion. And if somebody really do write a bad review, that means nothing work. No emotion, no thinking, no questioning. You cannot please everybody. You know, if you're loved by some people, it's enough. If you, some people are willing to see your next film, it's enough. I don't think, I don't know what you think, Eugene, but you, I don't think you can say that uh, a filmmaker had always good critic on a career. Why should every film be always top? I mean, like, you cannot do in a career always the top level of your films. It's like if you ask a painter, all you know should be perfect. If you ask a writer, all your books should be, you know, the best prices. I think what you should do is look a body work of somebody, and try to think if this work has a meaning, has a sense. I think she would maybe answer something around that, you know, around. If there's two seconds, I'll just share a quick story. So those of you who have seen Faces Places know there's like a kind of a twist ending that's a little bit heartbreaking, um, but ultimately is the thing that um, makes the film really work because it gets in, into your heart and into your soul. So we're all at the Oscars, right? This crazy little movie ends up at the Oscars, the front runner 
everybody thought it ha- they had in their bag. I mean, the Academy thought they had. They had Greta Gerwig up there to give the Oscar to Agnes, right? They had staged everything. Nope. <laughs> Didn't win. We're all crushed. But secretly, I think Agnes was like, yes, I got my ending. You know? <laughs> 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 Yeah, I was very annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> um, his uh, head of his uh, studio, Emil, like his producer, was like, you know, he's a sportif. He does tennis. He does football. So he's in the competition. You know, he's like, like he was like, oh no, shit, no, like that. Agnes was like, um, mm. oh yeah, we were nearly, we nearly had it, and I was like. Oh, We've still, we're still, we don't have it, but we've been here, still here with our little project, you know, begin, you know, yeah, in a restaurant here with Ryan. And I thought, well, at least we've been, we we've did, did the no, red carpet. The night before they <laughs> had won the Independent Spirit Award, and Anya said that was the right one. Yes. That's the one we did. Well, won. yes, because once again, she said, you know, when she received the Governor's Award um, the year before, um, she said, I mean, something like, I'm on the margin. I've been always in the margin. But my film went all over the world. And some of my films are loved. And this is enough for me. So maybe, you know, um, it's what we should tell young filmmakers. Um, work and put your, you know, I mean, put your heart and... and even if you have bad critics, even it doesn't work, that doesn't mean you cannot do this. Uh, I mean, not a career, but that doesn't mean you cannot do more films. You know, like La Pointe Court, her first film had very bad reviews. It was 54. If she would have stopped doing it because she had bad reviews, we would not have the other films. So. Critics, I'm sorry, are important. <laughs> but I if, won't you take it do, personally. if you do a bad critic tomorrow, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we and sometimes are. we're wrong. <laughs> we are out of time, I'm so sorry to say. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this conversation that we entitled We Love and Yes, because we love and yes. Um, I hope you will join us uh, tomorrow night to see Varda Bayanes, and I hope to see you again later this uh, fall and winter for the celebration of her work. Thank you very much. <laughs>